Section five of Eureka, a prose poem by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I maintain first that only in the mode described is it conceivable that matter could have been diffused so as to fulfill at once the conditions of irradiation and of generally equable distribution. I maintain, secondly, that these conditions themselves have been opposed upon me as necessities in a train of ratiocination as rigorously logical as that which establishes any demonstration in Euclid. And I maintain, thirdly, that even if the charge of hypothesis were as fully sustained as it is, in fact, unsustained and untenable, still the validity and indisputability of my result would not, even in the slightest particular, be disturbed to explain the newtonian gravity a law of nature a law whose existence as such no one out of bedlam questions a law whose admission as such enables us to account for nine-tenths of the universal phenomena a law which merely because it does so enable us to account for these phenomena we are perfectly willing without reference to any other considerations to admit and cannot help admitting as a law, a law, nevertheless, of which neither the principle nor the modus operandi of the principle has ever yet been traced by the human analysis. A law, in short, which neither in its detail nor in its generality has been found susceptible of explanation at all, is at length seen to be at every point thoroughly explicable, provided only we yield our assent to what? to an hypothesis why if an hypothesis if the merest hypothesis if an hypothesis for whose assumption as in the case of that pure hypothesis the newtonian law itself no shadow of a priori reason could be assigned if an hypothesis even so absolute as all this implies would enable us to perceive a principle for the newtonian law would enable us to understand as satisfied conditions so miraculously so ineffably complex and seemingly irreconcilable as those involved in the relations of which gravity tells us what rational being could so expose his fatuity as to call even this absolute hypothesis an hypothesis any longer unless indeed he were to persist in so calling it with the understanding that he did so simply for the sake of consistency in words but what is the true state of our present case what is the fact not only that it is not an hypothesis which we are required to adopt in order to admit the principle at issue explained but that it is a logical conclusion which we are requested not to adopt if we can avoid it which we are simply invited to deny if we can a conclusion of so accurate a logicality that to dispute it would be the effort to doubt its validity beyond our power a conclusion from which we see no mode of escape turn as we will a result which confronts us either at the end of an inductive journey from the phenomena of the very law discussed or at the close of a deductive career from the most rigorously simple of all conceivable assumptions the assumption in a word of simplicity itself and if here for the mere sake of cavilling it be urged that although my starting point is as i assert the assumption of absolute simplicity yet simplicity considered merely in itself is no axiom and that only deductions from axioms are indisputable it is thus that i reply every other science than logic is the science of certain concrete relations arithmetic for example is the science of the relations of number geometry of the relations of form mathematics in general of the relations of quantity in general of whatever can be increased or diminished logic however is the science of relation in the abstract of absolute relation of relation considered solely in itself an axiom in any particular science other than logic is thus merely a proposition announcing certain concrete relations which seem to be too obvious for dispute as when we say for instance that the whole is greater than its part and thus again the principle of the logical axiom in other words of an axiom in the abstract is simply 
obviousness of relation now it is clear not only that what is obvious to one mind may not be obvious to another but that what is obvious to one mind at one epoch may be anything but obvious at another epoch to the same mind it is clear moreover that what to-day is obvious even to the majority of mankind or to the majority of the best intellects of mankind may to-morrow be to either majority more or less obvious or in no respect obvious at all it is seen then that the axiomatic principle itself is susceptible of variation and of course that axioms are susceptible of similar change being mutable the truths which grow out of them are necessarily mutable too or in other words are never to be positively depended upon as truths at all since truth and immutability are one it will now be readily understood that no axiomatic idea no idea founded in the fluctuating principle obviousness of relation can possibly be so secure so reliable a basis for any structure erected by the reason as that idea whatever it is wherever we can find it or if it be practicable to find it anywhere which is irrelative altogether which not only presents to the understanding no obviousness of relation either greater or less to be considered but subjects the intellect not in the slightest degree to the necessity of even looking at any relation at all if such an idea be not what we too heedlessly term an axiom it is at least preferable as a logical basis to any axiom ever propounded or to all imaginable axioms combined and such precisely is the idea with which my deductive process so thoroughly corroborated by induction commences my particle proper is but absolute irrelation to sum up what has been here advanced as a starting point i have taken it for granted simply that the beginning had nothing behind it or before it that it was a beginning in fact that it was a beginning and nothing different from a beginning in short that this beginning was that which it was if this be a mere assumption then a mere assumption let it be to conclude this branch of the subject i am fully warranted in announcing that the law which we have been in the habit of calling gravity exists on account of matter having been irradiated at its origin automatically into a limited sphere of space from one individual unconditional irrelative and absolute particle proper by the sole process in which it was possible to satisfy at the same time the two conditions irradiation and generally equable distribution throughout the sphere that is to say by a force varying in direct proportion with the squares of the distances between the irradiated atoms respectively and the particular centre of irradiation i have already given my reasons for presuming matter to have been diffused by a determinate rather than by a continuous or infinitely continued force supposing a continuous force we should be unable in the first place to comprehend a reaction at all and we should be required in the second place to entertain the impossible conception of an infinite extension of matter not to dwell upon the impossibility of the conception the infinite extension of matter is an idea which if not positively disproved is at least not in any respect warranted by telescopic observation of the stars a point to be explained more fully hereafter and this empirical reason for believing in the original affinity of matter is unempirically confirmed for example admitting for the moment the possibility of understanding space filled with the irradiated atoms that is to say admitting as well as we can for argument's sake that the succession of the irradiated atoms had absolutely no end then it is abundantly clear that even when the volition of god had been withdrawn from them and thus the tendency to return into unity permitted abstractly to be satisfied this permission would have been nugatory and invalid practically valueless and of no effect whatever 
no reaction could have taken place no movement toward unity could have been made no law of gravity could have been obtained to explain grant the abstract tendency of any one atom to any one other as the inevitable result of diffusion from the normal unity or what is the same thing admit any given atom as proposing to move in any given direction it is clear that since there is an infinity of atoms on all sides of the atom proposing to move it never can actually move toward the satisfaction of its tendency in the direction given on account of a precisely equal and counterbalancing tendency in the direction diametrically opposite in other words exactly as many tendencies to unity are behind the hesitating atom as before it for it is a mere sodicism to say that one infinite line is longer or shorter than another infinite line or that one infinite number is greater or less than another number that is infinite thus the atom in question must remain stationary forever under the impossible circumstances which we have been merely endeavoring to conceive for argument's sake there could have been no aggregation of matter no stars no worlds nothing but a perpetually atomic and inconsequential universe in fact view it as we will the whole idea of unlimited matter is not only untenable but impossible and preposterous with the understanding of a sphere of atoms however we perceive at once a satisfiable tendency to union the general result of the tendency each to each being a tendency of all to the centre the general process of condensation or approximation commences immediately by a common and simultaneous movement on withdrawal of the divine volition the individual approximations or coalescences not coalitions of atom with atom being subject to almost infinite variations of time degree and condition on account of the excessive multiplicity of relation arising from the differences of form assumed as characterizing the atoms at the moment of their quitting the particle proper as well as from the subsequent particle in equidistance each from each what i wish to impress upon the reader is the certainty of their arising at once on withdrawal of the diffusive force or divine volition out of the condition of the atoms as described at innumerable points throughout the universal sphere innumerable agglomerations characterized by innumerable specific differences of form size essential nature and distance each from each the development of repulsion electricity must have commenced of course with the very earliest particular efforts at unity and must have proceeded constantly in the ratio of coalescence that is to say in that of condensation or again of heterogeneity thus the two principles proper attraction and repulsion the material and the spiritual accompany each other in the strictest fellowship forever thus the body and the soul walk hand in hand if now in fancy we select any one of the agglomerations considered as their primary stages throughout the universal sphere and suppose this incipient agglomeration to be taking place at the point where the center of our sun exists or rather where it did exist originally for the sun is perpetually shifting his position we shall find ourselves met and borne onward for a time at least by the most magnificent of theories by the nebular cosmogony of laplace although cosmogony is far too comprehensive a term for what he really discusses which is the constitution of our solar system alone of one among the myriad of similar systems which make up the universe proper that universal sphere that all-inclusive and absolute cosmos which forms the subject of my present discourse confining himself to an obviously limited region that of our solar system with its comparatively immediate vicinity and merely assuming that is to say assuming without any basis whatever either deductive or inductive much of what i have been just endeavoring to place upon a more stable basis than assumption assuming for example matter is diffused without pretending to account for the diffusion throughout and somewhat beyond the space occupied by our system 
diffused in a state of heterogeneous nebulosity and obedient to that omniprevalent law of gravity at whose principle he ventured to make no guess assuming all this which is quite true although he had no logical right to its assumption laplace has shown dynamically and mathematically that the results in such case necessarily ensuing are those and those alone which we find manifested in the actually existing condition of the system itself to explain let us conceive that particular agglomeration of which we have just spoken the one at the point designated by our sun's centre to have so far proceeded that a vast quantity of nebulous matter has here assumed a roughly globular form its centre being of course coincident with what is now or rather what was originally the centre of our sun and its periphery extending out beyond the orbit of neptune the most remote of our planets in other words let us assume the diameter of this rough sphere to be some six thousand millions of miles for ages this mass of matter has been undergoing condensation until at length it has become reduced into the bulk we imagine having proceeded gradually of course from its atomic and imperceptible state into what we understand of visible palpable or otherwise appreciable nebulosity now the condition of this mass implies a rotation about an imaginary axis a rotation which commencing with the absolute incipiency of the aggregation has been ever since acquiring velocity the very first two atoms which met approaching each other from points not diametrically opposite would in rushing partially past each other form a nucleus for the rotary movement described how this would increase in velocity is readily seen the two atoms are joined by others an aggregation is formed the mass continues to rotate while condensing but any atom at the circumference has of course a more rapid motion than one near the centre the outer atom however with its superior velocity approaches the centre carrying the superior velocity with it as it goes thus every atom proceeding inwardly and finally attaching itself to the condensed centre adds something to the original velocity of that centre that is to say increases the rotary movement of the mass let us now suppose this mass so far condensed that it occupies precisely the space circumscribed by the orbit of neptune and that the velocity with which the surface of the mass moves in the general rotation is precisely that velocity which neptune now revolves about the sun at this epoch then we are to understand that the constantly increasing centrifugal force having gotten the better of the non-increasing centripetal loosened and separated the exterior and least condensed stratum or a few of the exterior and least condensed strata at the equator of the sphere where the tangential velocity predominated so that the strata formed about the main body an independent ring encircling the equatorial regions just as the exterior portion thrown off by excessive velocity of rotation from a grindstone would form a ring about the grindstone but for the solidity of the superficial material were this caoutchouc or anything similar in consistency precisely the phenomenon i describe would be presented the ring thus whirled from the nebulous mass revolved of course as a separate ring with just that velocity with which while the surface of the mass is rotated in the meantime condensation still proceeding the interval between the discharged ring and the main body continued to increase until the former was left at a vast distance from the latter now admitting the ring to have possessed by some seemingly accidental arrangement of its heterogeneous materials a constitution nearly uniform then this ring as such would never have ceased revolving about its primary but as might have been anticipated there appears to have been enough irregularity in the disposition of the materials to make them cluster about centers of superior solidity and thus the annular form was destroyed no doubt the band was soon broken up into several portions and one of these portions predominating in mass absorbed the others into itself the whole settling spherically into a planet 
that this latter as a planet continued the revolutionary movement which characterized it while a ring is sufficiently clear and that it took upon itself also an additional movement in its new condition of sphere is readily explained the ring being understood as yet unbroken we see that its exterior while the whole revolves about the parent body moves more rapidly than its interior while the rupture occurred then some portion in each fragment must have been moving with greater velocity than the others the superior movement prevailing must have whirled each fragment round that is to say have caused it to rotate and the direction of the rotation must of course have been the direction of the revolution whence it arose all the fragments having become subject to the rotation described must in coalescing have imparted it to the one planet constituted by their coalescence this planet was neptune its material continuing to undergo condensation and the centrifugal force generated in its rotation getting at length the better of the centripetal as before in the case of the parent orb a ring was whirled also from the equatorial surface of this planet this ring having been ununiform in its constitution was broken up and its several fragments being absorbed by the most massive were collectively spherified into a moon subsequently the operation was repeated and a second moon was the result we thus account for the planet neptune with the two satellites which accompany him in throwing off a ring from its equator the sun re-established that equilibrium between its centripetal and centrifugal forces which had been disturbed in the process of condensation but as this condensation still proceeded the equilibrium was again immediately disturbed through the increase of rotation by the time the mass had so far shrunk that it occupied a spherical space just that circumscribed by the orbit of uranus we are to understand that the centrifugal force had so far obtained the ascendancy that new relief was needed a second equatorial band was consequently thrown off which proving ununiform was broken up as before in the case of neptune the fragments settling into the planet uranus the velocity of whose actual revolution about the sun indicates of course the rotary speed of that sun's equatorial surface at the moment of the separation uranus adopting a rotation from the collective rotations of the fragments composing it as previously explained now threw off ring after ring each of which becoming broken up settled into a moon three moons at different epochs having been formed in this manner by the rupture and general spherification of as many distinct ununiform rings by the time the sun had shrunk until it occupied a space just that circumscribed by the orbit of saturn the balance we are to suppose between its centripetal and centrifugal forces had again become so far disturbed through increase of rotary velocity the result of condensation that a third effort at equilibrium became necessary and an annular band was therefore whirled off as twice before which on rupture through ununiformity became consolidated into the planet saturn this latter threw off in the first place seven uniform bands which on rupture were spherified respectively into as many moons but subsequently it appears to have discharged at three distinct but not very distant epochs three rings whose equability of constitution was by apparent accident so considerable as to present no occasion for their rupture thus they continue to revolve as rings i use the phrase apparent accident for of accident in the ordinary sense there was of course nothing the term is properly applied only to the result of indistinguishable or not immediately traceable law shrinking still farther until it occupied just the space circumscribed by the orbit of jupiter the sun now found need of farther effort to restore the counterbalance of its two forces continually disarranged in the still continued increase of rotation jupiter accordingly was now thrown off passing from the annular to the planetary condition and on attaining this latter threw off in its turn at four different epochs four rings which finally resolved themselves into so many moons 
still shrinking until its sphere occupied just the space defined by the orbit of the asteroids the sun now discarded a ring which appears to have had eight centers of superior solidity and on breaking up to have separated into eight fragments no one of which so far predominated in mass as to absorb the others all therefore as distinct although comparatively small planets proceeded to revolve in orbits whose distances each from each may be considered as in some degree the measure of the force which drove them asunder all the orbits nevertheless being so closely coincident as to admit of our calling them one in view of the other planetary orbits continuing to shrink the sun on becoming so small as just to fill the orbit of mars now discharged this planet of course by the process repeatedly described having no moon however mars could have thrown off no ring in fact an epoch had now arrived in the career of the parent body the center of the system the decrease of its nebulosity which is the increase of its density and which again is the decrease of its condensation out of which latter arose the constant disturbance of equilibrium must by this period have attained a point at which the efforts for restoration would have been more and more ineffectual just in proportion as they were less frequently needed thus the process of which we have been speaking would everywhere show signs of exhaustion in the planets first and secondly in the original mass we must not fall into the error of supposing the decrease of interval observed among the planets as we approach the sun to be in any respect indicative of an increase of frequency in the periods at which they were discarded exactly the converse is to be understood the longest interval of time must have occurred between the discharges of the two interior the shortest between those of the two exterior planets the decrease of the interval of space is nevertheless the measure of the density and thus inversely of the condensation of the sun throughout the processes detailed having shrunk however so far as to fill only the orbit of our earth the parent sphere whirled from itself still one other body the earth in a condition so nebulous as to admit of this body's discarding in its turn yet another which is our moon but here terminated the lunar formations finally subsiding to the orbits first of venus and then of mercury the sun discarded these two interior planets neither of which has given birth to any moon thus from his original bulk or so to speak more accurately from the condition in which we first considered him from a partially spherified nebular mass certainly much more than five thousand six hundred millions of miles in diameter the great central orb and origin of our solar planetary lunar system has gradually descended by condensation in obedience to the law of gravity to a globe only eight hundred and eighty two thousand miles in diameter but it by no means follows either that its condensation is yet complete or that it may not still possess the capacity of whirling from itself another planet i have here given in outline of course but still with all the detail necessary for distinctness a view of the nebular theory as its author himself conceived it from whatever point we regard it we shall find it beautifully true it is by far too beautiful indeed not to possess truth as its essentiality and here i am very profoundly serious in what i say in the revolution of the satellites of uranus there does appear something seemingly inconsistent with the assumptions of laplace but that one inconsistency can invalidate a theory constructed from a million of intricate consistencies is a fancy fit only for the fantastic in prophesying confidently that the apparent anomaly to which i refer will sooner or later be found one of the strongest possible corroborations of the general hypothesis i pretend to know a special spirit of divination it is a matter which the only difficulty seems not to foresee the bodies whirled off in the processes described would exchange it has been seen the superficial rotation of the orbs whence they originated 
for a revolution of equal velocity about these orbs as distant centers and the revolution thus engendered must proceed so long as the centripetal force or that which the discarded body gravitates toward its parent is neither greater nor less than that by which it was discarded that is than the centrifugal or far more properly than the tangential velocity from the unity however of the origin of these two forces we might have expected to find them as they are found the one accurately counterbalancing the other it has been shown indeed that the act of whirling off is in every case merely an act for the preservation of the counterbalance after referring however the centripetal force to the omniprevalent law of gravity it has been the fashion with astronomical treatises to seek beyond the limits of mere nature that is to say of secondary cause a solution of the phenomena of tangential velocity this latter they attribute directly to a first cause to god the force which carries a stellar body around its primary they assert to have originated in the impulse given immediately by the finger this is the childish phraseology employed by the finger of deity itself in this view the planets fully formed are conceived to have been hurled from the divine hand to a position in the vicinity of the suns with an impetus mathematically adapted to the masses or attractive capacities of the suns themselves an idea so grossly unphilosophical although so supinely adopted could have arisen only from the difficulty of otherwise accounting for the absolutely accurate adaptation each to each of two forces so seemingly independent one of the other as are the gravitating and tangential but it should be remembered that for a long time the coincidence between the moon's rotation and her sidereal revolution two matters seemingly far more independent than those now considered was looked upon as positively miraculous and there was a strong disposition even among astronomers to attribute the marvel to the direct and continual agency of god who in this case it was said had found it necessary to interpose specially among his general laws a set of subsidiary regulations for the purpose of forever concealing from mortal eyes the glories or perhaps the horrors of the other side of the moon of that mysterious hemisphere which has always avoided and must perpetually avoid the telescopic scrutiny of mankind the advance of science however soon demonstrated what to the philosophical instinct needed no demonstration that the one movement is but a portion something more even than a consequence of the other for my part i have no patience with fantasies at once so timorous so idle and so awkward they belong to the veriest cowardice of thought that nature and the god of nature are distinct no thinking being can long doubt by the former we imply merely the laws of the latter but with the very idea of god omnipotent omniscient we entertain also the idea of the infallibility of his laws with him there being neither past nor future with him all being now do we not insult him in supposing his laws so contrived as not to provide for every possible contingency or rather what idea can we have of any possible contingency except that it is at once a result and a manifestation of his laws he who divesting himself of prejudice shall have the rare courage to think absolutely for himself cannot fail to arrive in the end at the condensation of laws into law cannot fail of reaching the conclusion that each law of nature is dependent at all points upon all other laws and that all are but consequences of one primary exercise of the divine volition such is the principle of the cosmogony which with all necessary deference i here venture to suggest and to maintain in this view it will be seen that dismissing as frivolous and even impious the fancy of the tangential force having been imparted to the planets immediately by the finger of god i consider this force as originating in the rotation of the stars 
this rotation as brought about by the inrushing of the primary atoms toward their respective centers of aggregation this inrushing as the consequence of the law of gravity this law as but the mode in which is necessarily manifested the tendency of the atoms to return into imparticularity this tendency to return as but the inevitable reaction of the first and most sublime of acts that act by which a god self-existing and alone existing became all things at once through dint of his volition while all things were thus constituted a portion of god End of section five. Section six of Eureka, a prose poem by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The radical assumptions of this discourse suggest to me, and in fact imply, certain important modifications of the nebular theory as given by Laplace the efforts of the repulsive power i have considered as made for the purpose of preventing contact among the atoms and thus as made in the ratio of the approach to contact that is to say in the ratio of condensation in other words electricity with its involute phenomena heat light and magnetism is to be understood as proceeding as condensation proceeds and of course inversely as density proceeds or the cessation to condense thus the sun in the process of its aggregation must soon in developing repulsion have become excessively heated perhaps incandescent and we can perceive how the operation of discarding its rings must have been materially assisted by the slight incrustation of its surface consequent on cooling any common experiment shows us how readily a crust of the character suggested is separated through heterogeneity from the interior mass but on every successive rejection of the crust the new surface would appear incandescent as before and the period at which it would again become so far encrusted as to be readily loosened and discharged may well be imagined as exactly coincident with that at which a new effort would be needed by the whole mass to restore the equilibrium of its two forces disarranged through condensation in other words by the time the electric influence repulsion has prepared the surface for rejection we are to understand that the gravitating influence attraction is precisely ready to reject it here then as everywhere the body and the soul walk hand in hand these ideas are empirically confirmed at all points since condensation can never in any body be considered as absolutely at an end we are warranted in anticipating that whenever we have an opportunity of testing the matter we shall find indications of resident luminosity in all the stellar bodies moons and planets as well as suns that our moon is strongly self-luminous we see at her every total eclipse when if not so she would disappear on the dark part of the satellite too during her phases we often observe flashes like our own auroras and that these latter with our various other so-called electrical phenomena without reference to any more steady radiance must give our earth a certain appearance of luminosity to an inhabitant of the moon is quite evident in fact we should regard all the phenomena referred to as mere manifestations in different moods and degrees of the earth's feebly continued condensation if my views are tenable we should be prepared to find the newer planets that is to say those near the sun more luminous than those older and more remote and the extreme brilliancy of venus on whose dark portions during her phases the auroras are frequently visible does not seem to be altogether accounted for by her mere proximity to the central orb she is no doubt vividly self-luminous although less so than mercury while the luminosity of neptune may be comparatively nothing admitting what i have urged it is clear that from the moment of the sun's discarding a ring there must be a continuous diminution both of its heat and light on account of the continuous encrustation of his surface and that a period would arrive the period immediately previous to a new discharge when a very material decrease of both light and heat 
must become apparent now we know that tokens of such changes are distinctly recognizable on the melville islands to adduce merely one out of a hundred examples we find traces of ultra-tropical vegetation of plants that never could have flourished without immensely more light and heat than are at present afforded by our sun to any portion of the surface of the earth is such vegetation referable to an epoch immediately subsequent to the whirling off of venus at this epoch must have occurred to us our greatest access of solar influence and in fact this influence must then have attained its maximum leaving out of view of course the period when the earth itself was discarded the period of its mere organization again we know that there exist non-luminous suns that is to say suns whose existence we determine through the movements of others but whose luminosity is not sufficient to impress us are these suns invisible merely on account of the length of time elapsed since their discharge of a planet and yet again may we not at least in certain cases account for the sudden appearances of suns where none had been previously suspected by the hypothesis that having rolled with encrusted surfaces throughout the few thousand years of our astronomical history each of these suns in whirling off a new secondary has at length been enabled to display the glories of its still incandescent interior to the well ascertained fact of the proportional increase of heat as we descend into the earth i need of course do nothing more than refer it comes in the strongest possible corroboration of all that i have said on the topic now at issue in speaking not long ago of the repulsive or electrical influence i remark that the important phenomena of vitality consciousness and thought whether we observe them generally or in detail seem to proceed at least in the ratio of the heterogeneous i mentioned too that i would recur to the suggestion and this is the proper point at which to do so looking at the matter first in detail we perceive that not merely the manifestation of vitality but its importance consequence and elevation of character keep pace very closely with the heterogeneity or complexity of the animal structure looking at the question now in its generality and referring to the first movements of the atoms towards mass construction we find that heterogeneousness brought about directly through condensation is proportional with it forever we thus reach the proposition that the importance of the development of the terrestrial vitality proceeds equably with the terrestrial condensation now this is in precise accordance with what we know of the succession of animals on the earth as it has proceeded in the condensation superior and still superior races have appeared is it impossible that the successive geological revolutions which have attended at least if not immediately caused these successive elevations of vitalic character is it improbable that these revolutions have themselves been produced by the successive planetary discharges from the sun in other words by the successive variations in the solar influence on the earth were this idea tenable we should not be unwarranted in the fancy that the discharge of yet a new planet interior to mercury may give rise to yet a new modification of the terrestrial surface a modification from which may spring a race both materially and spiritually superior to man these thoughts impress me with all the force of truth but i throw them out of course merely in their obvious character of suggestion the nebular theory of laplace has lately received far more confirmation than it needed at the hands of the philosopher comte these two have thus together shown not to be sure that matter at any period actually existed as described in a state of nebular diffusion but that admitting it so to have existed throughout the space and much beyond the space now occupied by our solar system and to have commenced a movement towards a centre it must gradually have assumed the various forms and motions which are now seen in that system to obtain a demonstration such as this a dynamical and mathematical demonstration as far as demonstration can be 
unquestionable and unquestioned unless indeed by that unprofitable and disreputable tribe the professional questioners the mere madmen who deny the newtonian law of gravity on which the results of the french mathematicians are based a demonstration i say such as this would to most intellects be conclusive and i confess that it is so to mine of the validity of the nebular hypothesis upon which the demonstration depends that the demonstration does not prove the hypothesis according to the common understanding of the word proof i admit of course to show that certain existing results that certain established facts may be even mathematically accounted for by the assumption of certain hypotheses is by no means to establish the hypothesis itself in other words to show that certain data being given a certain existing result might or even must have ensued will fail to prove that this result did ensue from the data until such times it shall be also shown that there are and can be no other data from which the result in question might equally have ensued but in the case now discussed although all must admit the deficiency of what we are in the habit of terming proof still there are many intellects and those of the loftiest order to which no proof could bring one iota of additional conviction without going into details which might impinge upon the cloudland of metaphysics i may as well here observe that the force of conviction in cases such as this will always with the right thinking be proportional to the amount of complexity intervening between the hypothesis and the result to be less abstract the greatness of the complexity found existing among cosmical conditions by rendering great in the same proportion the difficulty of accounting for all these conditions at once strengthens also in the same proportion our faith in that hypothesis which does in such manner satisfactorily account for them and as no complexity can well be conceived greater than that of the astronomical conditions so no conviction can be stronger to my mind at least than that with which i am impressed by an hypothesis that not only reconciles these conditions with mathematical accuracy and reduces them into a consistent and intelligible whole but is at the same time the sole hypothesis by means of which the human intellect has been ever enabled to account for them at all a most unfounded opinion has become latterly current in gossiping and even in scientific circles the opinion that the so-called nebular cosmogony has been overthrown this fancy has arisen from the report of late observations made among what hitherto have been termed the nebula through the large telescope of cincinnati and the world-renowned instrument of lord ross certain spots in the firmament which presented even to the most powerful of the old telescopes the appearance of nebulosity or haze had been regarded for a long time as confirming the theory of laplace they were looked upon as stars in that very process of condensation which i have been attempting to describe thus it was supposed that we had ocular evidence an evidence by the way which has always been found very questionable of the truth of the hypothesis and although certain telescopic improvements every now and then enabled us to perceive that a spot here and there which we had been classing among the nebula was in fact but a cluster of stars deriving its nebular character only from its immensity of distance still it was thought that no doubt could exist as to the actual nebulosity of numerous other masses the strongholds of the nebulists bidding defiance to every effort at segregation of these latter the most interesting was the great nebula in the constellation orion but this with innumerable other miscalled nebula when viewed through the magnificent modern telescopes has become resolved into a simple collection of stars now this fact has been very generally understood as conclusive against the nebular hypothesis of laplace and on announcement of the discoveries in question the most enthusiastic defender and most eloquent popularizer of the theory dr nichol went so far as to admit the necessity of abandoning an idea which had formed the material of his most praiseworthy book 
many of my readers will no doubt be inclined to say that the result of these new investigations has at least a strong tendency to overthrow the hypothesis while some of them more thoughtful will suggest that although the theory is by no means disproved through the segregation of the particular nebula alluded to still a failure to segregate them with such telescopes might well have been understood as a triumphant corroboration of the theory and this latter class will be surprised perhaps to hear me say that even with them i disagree if the propositions of this discourse have been comprehended it will be seen that in my view a failure to segregate the nebula would have tended to the refutation rather than to the confirmation of the nebular hypothesis let me explain the newtonian law of gravity we may of course assume as demonstrated this law it will be remembered i referred to the reaction of the first divine act to the reaction of an exercise of the divine volition temporarily overcoming a difficulty this difficulty is that of forcing the normal into the abnormal of impelling that whose originality and therefore whose rightful condition was one to take upon itself the wrongful condition of many it is only by conceiving this difficulty as temporarily overcome that we can comprehend a reaction there could have been no reaction had the act been infinitely continued so long as the act lasted no reaction of course could commence in other words no gravitation could take place for we have considered the one as but the manifestation of the other but gravitation has taken place therefore the act of creation has ceased and gravitation has long ago taken place therefore the act of creation has long ago ceased we can no more expect then to observe the primary processes of creation and to these primary processes the condition of nebulosity has already been explained to belong through what we know of the propagation of light we have direct proof that the more remote of the stars have existed under forms in which we now see them for an inconceivable number of years so far back at least then as the period when these stars underwent condensation must have been the epoch at which the mass constitutive processes began that we may conceive these processes then as still going on in the case of certain nebula while in all other cases we find them thoroughly at an end we are forced into assumptions for which we have really no basis whatever we have to thrust in again upon the revolting reason the blasphemous idea of special interposition we have to suppose that in the particular instances of these nebula an unerring god found it necessary to introduce certain supplementary regulations certain improvements of the general law certain retouchings and amendations in a word which had the effect of deferring the completion of these individual stars for centuries of centuries beyond the era during which all the other stellar bodies had time not only to be fully constituted but to grow hoary with an unspeakable old age of course it will be immediately objected that since the light by which we recognize the nebula now must be merely that which left their surfaces a vast number of years ago the processes at present observed or supposed to be observed are in fact not processes now actually going on but the phantoms of processes completed long in the past just as i maintain all these mass constitutive processes must have been to this i reply that neither is the now observed condition of the condensed stars their actual condition but a condition completed long in the past so that my argument drawn from the relative condition of the stars and the nebula is in no manner disturbed moreover those who maintain the existence of nebula do not refer to the nebulosity to extreme distance they declare it a real and not merely a perspective nebulosity that we may conceive indeed a nebular mass as visible at all we must conceive it as very near us in comparison with the condensed stars brought into view by the modern telescopes in maintaining the appearances in question then to be really nebulous we maintain their comparative vicinity to our point of view 
thus their condition as we see them now must be referred to an epoch far less remote than that to which we may refer the now observed condition of at least the majority of the stars in a word should astronomy ever demonstrate a nebula in the sense at present intended i should consider the nebular cosmogony not indeed as corroborated by the demonstration but as thereby irretrievably overthrown by way however of rendering unto caesar no more than the things that are caesar's let me here remark that the assumption of the hypothesis which led him to so glorious a result seems to have been suggested to laplace in great measure by a misconception by the very misconception of which we have just been speaking by the generally prevalent misunderstanding of the character of the nebula so misnamed these he supposed to be in reality what their designation implies the fact is this great man had very properly an inferior faith in his own merely perceptive powers in respect therefore to the actual existence of nebula an existence so confidently maintained by his telescopic contemporaries he depended less upon what he saw than upon what he heard it will be seen that the only valid objections to his theory are those made to its hypothesis as such to what suggested it not to what it suggests to its propositions rather than to its results his most unwarranted assumption was that of giving the atoms a movement towards a centre in the very face of his evident understanding that these atoms in unlimited succession extended throughout the universal space i have already shown that under such circumstances there could have occurred no movement at all and laplace consequently assumed one on no more philosophical ground than something of the kind was necessary for the establishment of what he intended to establish his original idea seems to have been a compound of the true epicurean atoms with the false nebula of his contemporaries and thus his theory presents us with the singular anomaly of absolute truth deduced as a mathematical result from a hybrid datum of ancient imagination intertangled with modern inacumen laplace's real strength lay in fact in the most miraculous mathematical instinct on this he relied and in no instance did it fail or deceive him in the case of the nebular cosmogony it led him blindfolded through a labyrinth of error into one of the most luminous and stupendous temples of truth let us now fancy for the moment that the ring first thrown off by the sun that is to say the ring whose breaking up constituted neptune did not in fact break up until the throwing off of the ring out of which uranus arose that this latter ring again remained perfect until the discharge of that out of which sprang saturn that this latter again remained entire until the discharge of that from which originated jupiter and so on let us imagine in a word that no dissolution occurred among the rings until the final rejection of that which gave birth to mercury we thus paint to the eye of the mind a series of coexistent concentric circles and looking as well at them as the processes by which according to laplace's hypothesis they were constructed we perceive at once a very singular analogy with the atomic strata and the process of the original irradiation as i have described it is it impossible that on measuring the forces respectively by which each successive planetary circle was thrown off that is to say on measuring the successive excesses of rotation over gravitation which occasion the successive discharges we should find the analogy in question more decidedly confirmed is it improbable that we should discover these forces to have varied as in the original radiation proportionally to the squares of the distances our solar system consisting in chief of one sun the sixteen planets certainly and possibly a few more revolving about it at various distances and attended by seventeen moons assuredly but very probably by several others is now to be considered as an example of the innumerable agglomerations which proceeded to take place throughout the universal sphere of atoms on withdrawal of the divine volition 
i mean to say that our solar system is to be understood as affording a generic instance of these agglomerations or more correctly of the ulterior conditions at which they arrived if we keep our attention fixed on the idea of the utmost possible relation as the omnipotent design and on the precautions taken to accomplish it through difference of form among the original atoms and particular in equidistance we shall find it impossible to suppose for a moment that even any two of the incipient agglomerations reached precisely the same result in the end we shall rather be inclined to think that no two stellar bodies in the universe whether suns planets or moons are particularly while all are generally similar still less then can we imagine any two assemblages of such bodies any two systems as having more than a general resemblance our telescopes at this point thoroughly confirm our deductions taking our own solar system then as merely a loose or general type of all we have so far proceeded in our subject as to survey the universe under the aspect of the spherical space throughout which dispersed with merely general equability exist a number of but generally similar systems end of section six section seven of eureka a prose poem by edgar allan poe this librivox recording is in the public domain let us now expanding our conceptions look upon each of these systems as in itself an atom which in fact it is when we consider it as but one of the countless myriads of systems which constitute the universe regarding all then as but colossal atoms each with the same ineradicable tendency to unity which characterizes the actual atoms of which it consists we enter at once upon a new order of aggregations the smaller systems in the vicinity of a larger one would inevitably be drawn into still closer vicinity a thousand would assemble here a million there perhaps here again even a billion leaving thus immeasurable vacancies in space and if now it be demanded why in the case of these systems of these merely titanic atoms i speak simply of an assemblage and not as the case of the actual atoms of a more or less consolidated agglomeration if it be asked for instance why i do not carry what i suggest to its legitimate conclusion and describe at once these assemblages of system atoms as rushing to consolidation in spheres as each becoming condensed into one magnificent sun my reply is that melanta tauta i am but pausing for a moment on the awful threshold of the future for the present calling these assemblages clusters we see them in the incipient stages of their consolidation their absolute consolidation is to come we have now reached a point from which we behold the universe as a spherical space interspersed unequitably with clusters it will be noticed that i here prefer the adverb unequably to the phrase with a merely general equability employed before it is evident in fact that the equability of distribution will diminish in the ratio of the agglomerative processes that is to say as the things distributed diminish in number thus the increase of inequability an increase which must continue until sooner or later an epoch will arrive at which the largest agglomeration will absorb all the others should be viewed as simply a corroborative indication of the tendency to one and here at length it seems proper to inquire whether the ascertained facts of astronomy confirm the general arrangement which i have thus deductively assigned to the heavens thoroughly they do telescopic observation guided by the laws of perspective enables us to understand that the perceptible universe exists as a cluster of clusters irregularly disposed the clusters of which this universal cluster of clusters consists are merely what we have been in the practice of designating nebula and of these nebula one is of paramount interest to mankind i allude to the galaxy or milky way 
this interests us first and foremost obviously on account of its great superiority in apparent size not only to any one other cluster in the firmament but to all the other clusters taken together the largest of these latter occupies a mere point comparatively and is distinctly seen only with the aid of a telescope the galaxy sweeps throughout the heaven and is brilliantly visible to the naked eye but it interests man chiefly although less immediately on account of its being his home the home of the earth on which he exists the home of the sun about which this earth revolves the home of that system of orbs which the sun is the center and primary the earth one of sixteen secondaries or planets the moon one of seventeen tertiaries or satellites the galaxy let me repeat is but one of the clusters which i have been describing but one of the miscalled nebula revealed to us by the telescope alone sometimes as faint hazy spots in various quarters of the sky we have no reason to suppose the milky way really more extensive than the least of these nebula its vast superiority in size is but an apparent superiority arising from our position in regard to it that is to say from our position in its midst however strange the assertion may at first appear to those unversed in astronomy still the astronomer himself has no hesitation in asserting that we are in the midst of that inconceivable host of stars of suns of systems which constitute the galaxy moreover not only have we not only has our sun a right to claim the galaxy as its own especial cluster but with slight reservation it may be said that all the distinctly visible stars of the firmament all the stars visible to the naked eye have equally a right to claim it as their own there has been a great deal of misconception in respect to the shape of the galaxy which in nearly all our astronomical treatises is said to resemble that of a capital y the cluster in question has in reality a certain general very general resemblance to the planet saturn with its encompassing triple ring instead of the solid orb of that planet however we must picture to ourselves a lenticular star island or collection of stars our sun lying eccentrically near the shore of the island on that side of it which is nearest the constellation of the cross and farthest from that of cassiopeia the surrounding ring where it approaches our position has in it a longitudinal gash which does in fact cause the ring in our vicinity to assume loosely the appearance of a capital y we must not fall into the error however of conceiving the somewhat indefinite girdle as at all remote comparatively speaking from the also indefinite lenticular cluster which it surrounds and thus for mere purpose of explanation we may speak of our sun as actually situated at the point of the y where its three component lines unite and conceiving this letter to be of a certain solidity of a certain thickness very trivial in comparison with its length we may even speak of our position as in the middle of this thickness fancying ourselves thus placed we shall no longer find difficulty in accounting for the phenomena presented which are perspective altogether when we look upward or downward that is to say when we cast our eyes in the direction of the letter's thickness we look through fewer stars than we cast them in the direction of its length or along either of the three component lines of course in the former case the stars appear scattered in the latter crowded to reverse this explanation an inhabitant of the earth when looking as we commonly express ourselves at the galaxy is then beholding it in some of the directions of its length is looking along the lines of the y but when looking out into the general heaven he turns his eyes from the galaxy he is then surveying it in the direction of the letter's thickness and on this account the stars seem to him scattered while in fact they are as close together on an average as in the mass of the cluster no consideration could be better adapted to convey an idea of this cluster's stupendous extent 
if with a telescope of high space penetrating power we carefully inspect the firmament we shall become aware of a belt of clusters of what we have hitherto called nebula a band of varying breadth stretching from horizon to horizon at right angles to the general course of the milky way this band is the ultimate cluster of clusters this belt is the universe our galaxy is but one and perhaps one of the most inconsiderable of the clusters which go to the constitution of this ultimate universal belt or band the appearance of this cluster of clusters to our eyes as a belt or band is altogether a perspective phenomenon of the same character as that which causes us to behold our own individual and roughly spherical cluster the galaxy under guise also of a belt traversing the heavens at right angles to the universal one the shape of the all-inclusive cluster is of course generally that of each individual cluster which it includes just as the scattered stars which on looking from the galaxy we see in the general sky are in fact but a portion of that galaxy itself and as closely intermingled with it as any of the telescopic points in what seems the densest portion of its mass so are the scattered nebula which on casting our eyes from the universal belt we perceive at all points of the firmament so i say are these scattered nebula to be understood as only perspectively scattered and as part and parcel of the one supreme and universal sphere no astronomical fallacy is more untenable and none has been more pertinaciously adhered to than that of the absolute illimitation of the universe of stars the reasons for limitation as i have already assigned them a priori seem to me unanswerable but not to speak of these observation assures us that there is in numerous directions around us certainly if not in all a positive limit or at the very least affords us no basis whatever for thinking otherwise were the succession of stars endless then the background of the sky would present us a uniform luminosity like that displayed by the galaxy since there could be absolutely no point in all that background at which would not exist a star the only mode therefore in which under such a state of affairs we could comprehend the voids which our telescopes find in innumerable directions would be by supposing the distance of the invisible background so immense that no ray from it has yet been able to reach us at all that this may be so who shall venture to deny i maintain simply that we have not even the shadow of a reason for believing that it is so when speaking of the vulgar propensity to regard all bodies on the earth as tending merely to the earth's centre i observe that with certain exceptions to the specified hereafter every body on the earth tended not only to the earth's centre but in every conceivable direction besides the exceptions refer to those frequent gaps in the heavens where our utmost scrutiny can detect not only no stellar bodies but no indications of their existence where yawning chasms blacker than erebus seem to afford us glimpses through the boundary walls of the universe of stars into the illimitable universe of vacancy beyond now as any body existing on the earth chances to pass either through its own movement or the earth's into a line with any one of these voids or cosmical abysses it clearly is no longer attracted in the direction of that void and for the moment consequently is heavier than at any period either after or before independently of the consideration of these voids however and looking only at the generally unequable distribution of the stars we see that the absolute tendency of bodies on the earth to the earth's centre is in a state of perpetual variation we comprehend then the insulation of our universe we perceive the isolation of that of all that which we grasp with the senses we know that there exists one cluster of clusters a collection around which on all sides extend the immeasurable wilderness of a space to all human perception untenanted but because upon the confines of this universe of stars we are compelled to pause 
through want of farther evidence from the senses is it right to conclude that in fact there is no material point beyond that which we have thus been permitted to attain have we or have we not an analogical right to the inference that this perceptible universe that this cluster of clusters is but one of a series of clusters of clusters the rest of which are invisible through distance through the diffusion of their light being so excessive ere it reaches us as not to produce upon our retinas a light impression or from there being no such emanation as light at all in these unspeakably distant worlds or lastly from the mere interval being so vast that the electric tidings of their presence in space have not yet through the lapsing myriads of years been able to traverse that interval have we any right to inferences have we any ground whatever for visions such as these if we have a right to them in any degree we have a right to their infinite extension the human brain has obviously a leaning to the infinite and fondles the phantom of the idea it seems to long with a passionate fervor for this impossible conception with the hope of intellectually believing it when conceived what is general among the whole race of man of course no individual of that race can be warranted in considering abnormal nevertheless there may be a class of superior intelligences to whom the human bias alluded to may wear all the character of monomania my question however remains unanswered have we any right to infer let us say rather to imagine an interminable succession of the cluster of clusters or of universes more or less similar i reply that the right in a case such as this depends absolutely upon the hardihood of that imagination which ventures to claim the right let me declare only that as an individual i myself feel impelled to the fancy without daring to call it more that there does exist a limitless succession of universes more or less similar to that of which we have cognizance to that of which alone we shall ever have cognizance at the very least until the return of our own particular universe into unity if such clusters of clusters exist however and they do it is abundantly clear that having had no part in our origin they have no portion in our laws they neither attract us nor we them their material their spirit is not ours is not that which obtains in any part of our universe they could not impress our senses or our souls among them and us considering all for the moment collectively there are no influences in common each exists apart and independently in the bosom of its proper and particular god in the conduct of this discourse i am aiming less at physical than at metaphysical order the clearness with which even material phenomena are presented to the understanding depends very little i have long since learned to perceive upon a merely natural and almost altogether upon a moral arrangement if then i seem to step somewhat too discursively from point to point of my topic let me suggest that i do so in the hope of thus the better keeping unbroken that chain of graduated impression by which alone the intellect of man can expect to encompass the grandeurs of which i speak and in their majestic totality to comprehend them so far our attention has been directed almost exclusively to a general and relative grouping of the stellar bodies in space of specification there has been little and whatever ideas of quantity have been conveyed that is to say of number magnitude and distance have been conveyed incidentally and by way of preparation for more definitive conceptions these latter let us now attempt to entertain our solar system as has been already mentioned consists in chief of one sun and sixteen planets certainly but in all probability a few others revolving around it as a centre and attended by seventeen moons of which we know with possibly several more of which as yet we know nothing these various bodies are not true spheres but oblate spheroids 
spheres flattened at the poles of the imaginary axes about which they rotate the flattening being a consequence of the rotation neither is the sun absolutely the center of the system for the sun itself with all the planets revolves about a perpetually shifting point of space which is the system's general center of gravity neither are we to consider the paths through which these different spheroids move the moons about the planets the planets about the sun or the sun about the common center as circles in an accurate sense they are in fact ellipses one of the foci being the point about which the revolution is made an ellipse is a curve returning into itself one of whose diameters is longer than the other in the longer diameter are two points equidistant from the middle of the line and so situated otherwise that if from each of them a straight line be drawn to any one point of the curve the two lines taken together will be equal to the longer diameter itself now let us conceive such an ellipse at one of the points mentioned which are the foci let us fasten an orange by an elastic thread let us connect this orange with a p and let us place this latter on the circumference of the ellipse let us now move the p continuously around the orange keeping always on the circumference of the ellipse the elastic thread which of course varies in length as we move the p will form what in geometry is called a radius vector now if the orange be understood as the sun and the p as a planet revolving about it then the revolution should be made at such a rate with a velocity so varying that the radius vector may pass over equal areas of space in equal times the progress of the p should be in other words the progress of the planet is of course slow in proportion to its distance from the sun swift in proportion to its proximity those planets moreover move the more slowly which are the farther from the sun the squares of their periods of revolution having the same proportion to each other as have to each other the cubes of their mean distances from the sun the wonderfully complex laws of revolution here described however are not to be understood as obtaining in our system alone they everywhere prevail where attraction prevails they control the universe every shining speck in the firmament is no doubt a luminous sun resembling our own at least in its general features and having in attendance upon it a greater or less number of planets greater or less whose still lingering luminosity is not sufficient to render them visible to us at so vast a distance but which nevertheless revolve moon attended about their starry centers in obedience to the principles just detailed in obedience to the three omniprevalent laws of revolution the three immortal laws guessed by the imaginative kepler and but subsequently demonstrated and accounted for by the patient and mathematical newton among a tribe of philosophers who pride themselves excessively upon matter of fact it is far too fashionable to sneer at all speculation under the comprehensive sobriquet guesswork the point to be considered is who guesses in guessing with plato we spend our time to better purpose now and then than in hearkening to a demonstration by alcmeon in many works on astronomy i find it distinctly stated that the laws of kepler are the basis of the great principle gravitation this idea must have arisen from the fact that the suggestion of these laws by kepler and his proving them a posteriori to have an actual existence led newton to account for them by his hypothesis of gravitation and finally to demonstrate them a priori as necessary consequences of the hypothetical principle thus so far from the laws of kepler being the basis of gravity gravity is the basis of these laws as it is indeed of all the laws of the material universe which are not referable to repulsion alone the mean distance of the earth from the moon that is to say from the heavenly body in our closest vicinity is two hundred and thirty seven thousand miles mercury the planet nearest the sun is distant from him thirty seven millions of miles venus the next revolves at a distance of sixty eight millions the earth which comes next at a distance of ninety five millions 
Mars then at the distance of 144 millions. Now comes the eight asteroids. Ceres, Juno, Vesta, Pallas, Astria, Flora, Iris, and Hebe, at an average distance of about 250 millions. Then we have Jupiter, distant 490 millions, then Saturn, 900 millions, then Uranus, 1900 millions, finally Neptune, lately discovered, and revolving at a distance, say, of 2800 millions leaving Neptune out of the account, of which as yet we know little accurately, and which is, possibly, one of a system of asteroids, it will be seen that, within certain limits, there exists an order of interval among the planets. Speaking loosely, we may say that each outer planet is twice as far from the sun as the next inner one. May not the order here mentioned, may not the law of Bode, be deduced from consideration of the analogy suggested by me as having place between the solar discharge of rings and the mode of the atomic irradiation. The numbers hurriedly mentioned in this summary of distance, it is folly to attempt comprehending, unless in the light of abstract arithmetical facts. They are not practically tangible ones. They convey no precise ideas. I have stated that Neptune, the planet farthest from the sun, revolves about him at a distance of 2,800 millions of miles. So far, so good. I have stated a mathematical fact, and, without comprehending it in the least, we may put it to use. Mathematically. But in mentioning even that the moon revolves about the earth at the comparatively trifling distance of 237,000 miles, I entertain no expectation of giving any one to understand, to know, to feel, how far from the earth the moon actually is. Two hundred and thirty-seven thousand miles! There are, perhaps, few of my readers who have not crossed the Atlantic Ocean, yet how many of them have a distinct idea of even the three thousand miles intervening between shore and shore? I doubt, indeed, whether the man lives who can force into his brain the most remote conception of the interval between one milestone and its next neighbor upon the turnpike. We are in some measure aided, however, in our consideration of distance, by combining this consideration with the kindred one of velocity. Sound passes through eleven hundred feet of space in a second of time. Now, were it possible for an inhabitant of the earth to see the flash of a cannon discharged in the moon, and to hear the report, he would have to wait, after perceiving the former, more than thirteen entire days and nights before getting any intimation of the latter. However feeble be the impression, even thus conveyed, of the moon's real distance from the earth, it will nevertheless affect a good object in enabling us more clearly to see the futility of attempting to grasp such intervals as that of the twenty-eight hundred millions of miles between our sun and Neptune, or even that of the ninety-five millions between the sun and the earth we inhabit. A cannonball flying at the greatest velocity with which such a ball has ever been known to fly could not traverse the latter interval in less than twenty years while for the former it would require five hundred and ninety. Our moon's real diameter is two thousand one hundred and sixty miles, yet she is comparatively so trifling an object that it would take nearly fifty such orbs to compose one as great as the earth. The diameter of our own globe is seven thousand nine hundred and twelve miles, but from the enunciation of these numbers what positive idea do we derive? If we ascend an ordinary mountain and look around us from its summit, we behold a landscape stretching, say, forty miles in every direction, forming a circle of two hundred and fifty miles in circumference, and including an area of five thousand square miles. The extent of such a process, on account of the successiveness with which its proportions necessarily present themselves to view, can be only very feebly and very partially appreciated yet the entire panorama would comprehend no more than one forty-thousandth part of the mere surface of our globe. Were this panorama then to be succeeded, after the lapse of an hour, by another of equal extent, this again by a third, 
after the lapse of another hour this again by the fourth after the lapse of another hour and so on until the scenery of the whole earth were exhausted and were we to be engaged in examining these various panoramas for twelve hours every day we should nevertheless be nine years and forty-eight days in completing the general survey but if the mere surface of the earth eludes the grasp of imagination what are we to think of its cubical contents it embraces a mass of matter equal in weight to at least two sextillion two hundred quintillions of tons let us suppose it in a state of quiescence and now let us endeavor to conceive a mechanical force sufficient to set it in motion not the strength of all the myriads of beings whom we may conclude to inhabit the planetary worlds of our system not the combined physical strength of all these beings even admitting all to be more powerful than man would avail to stir the ponderous mass a single inch from its position what are we to understand then of the force which under similar circumstances would be required to move the largest of our planets jupiter this is eighty six thousand miles in diameter and would include within its periphery more than a thousand orbs of the magnitude of our own yet this stupendous body is actually flying around the sun at a rate of twenty nine thousand miles an hour that is to say with a velocity of forty times greater than that of a cannonball the thought of such a phenomenon cannot well be said to startle the mind it palsies and appalls it not unfrequently we ask our imagination in picturing the capacities of an angel let us fancy such a being at a distance of some hundred miles from jupiter a close eye witness of the planet as it speeds on its annual revolution now can we i demand fashion for ourselves any conception so distinct of this ideal being's spiritual exaltation as that involved in the supposition that even by this immeasurable mass of matter whirled immediately before his eyes with a velocity so unutterable he an angel angelic though he be is not at once struck into nothingness and overwhelmed at this point however it seems proper to suggest that in fact we have been speaking of comparative trifles our sun the central and controlling orb of the system to which jupiter belongs is not only greater than jupiter but greater by far than all the planets of the system taken together this fact is an essential condition indeed of the stability of the system itself the diameter of jupiter has been mentioned it is eighty six thousand miles that of the sun is eight hundred and eighty two thousand miles an inhabitant of the latter travelling ninety miles a day would be more than eighty years in going around a great circle of its circumference it occupies a cubical space of six hundred and eighty one quadrillions four hundred and seventy two trillions of miles the moon as has been stated revolves about the earth at a distance of two hundred and thirty seven thousand miles in an orbit consequently of nearly a million and a half now were the sun placed upon the earth center over center the body of the former would extend in every direction not only to the line of the moon's orbit but beyond it a distance of two hundred thousand miles and here once again let me suggest that in fact we have still been speaking of comparative trifles the distance of the planet neptune from the sun has been stated it is twenty eight hundred millions of miles the circumference of its orbit therefore is about seventeen billions let this be borne in mind while we glance at some one of the brightest stars between this and the star of our system the sun there is a gulf of space to convey an idea of which we should need the tongue of an archangel from our system then and from our sun or the star the star at which we suppose ourselves glancing is a thing altogether apart still for the moment let us imagine it placed upon our sun centre over centre as we now imagine this sun itself placed upon the earth let us now conceive this particular star we have in mind extending in every direction beyond the orbit of mercury of venus 
of the earth still on beyond the orbit of mars beyond jupiter of uranus until finally we fancy it filling the circle seventeen billions of miles in circumference which is described by the revolution of leverrier's planet when we have conceived all this we shall have entertained no extravagant conception there is the very best reason for believing that many of the stars are even far larger than the one we have imagined i mean to say that we have the very best empirical basis for such belief and in looking back at the original atomic arrangements for diversity which have been assumed as a part of the divine plan in the constitution of the universe we shall be enabled easily to understand and to credit the existence of even far vaster disproportions in stellar size than any to which i have hitherto alluded the largest orbs of course we must expect to find rolling through the widest vacancies of space i remarked just now that to convey an idea of the interval between our sun and any one of the other stars we should require the eloquence of an archangel in so saying i should not be accused of exaggeration for in simple truth these are topics on which it is scarcely possible to exaggerate but let us bring the matter more distinctly before the eye of the mind End of section seven.